Hi, everybody, and welcome to JobScan's third annual No Fear Job Search Virtual Summit. Um, if this is your first session of the week, we're happy to have you here. Um, it's our third session of the day and um, of the No Fear Virtual Summit. Um, so if you're returning for your second or third webinar here, then we're happy to have you back. Um, we created this webinar series as a way to connect some of the best career experts with our job seekers because we feel like um, we want to help you supercharge your job search and get the most value out of our tools, um, but also just help you to land a job as quickly as possible. Um, as a thank you for attending, we are offering 20% off JobScan Premium. You can see the link um, at the upper right corner of your screen. Uh, but that link is jobscan.co slash promo slash no fear 2022. We'll share it uh, in the Q&A box and we'll share it again at the end. Um, we also have a giveaway going on where you can win six months free of JobScan Premium. Uh, in order to enter that giveaway, go to sweepwidget.com slash C slash JobScan to enter. Uh, entries are earned by either sharing um, the event on Twitter or LinkedIn and you have to share the link directly from the giveaway page. Uh, you can also enter by using the code that's unique for every session. So um, I'll be giving you a code for this session um, at the end, and uh, you can enter that in order to receive multiple entries. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's session, Tejal Wagadia, who is a recruiter um, and I'm sorry, and Tejal will be presenting on resume optimization. If you attended earlier today, um, we covered the same topic with Ediana Rosen, but we're really excited to hear Tejal's take on resume optimization and hear what her tips are. Um, feel free to ask questions for Tejal in the Q&A box, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Welcome, Tejal, and take it away. Hi, thank you, uh, Paige, uh, for having, and thank you, JobScan, for having me. Uh, one of the biggest things that I think I want to talk about um, when it comes to resumes is that people often overcomplicate uh, resumes and how it um, needs to be. Uh, your resume needs to tell your story, and um, the biggest thing is it shouldn't necessarily be one page. Now, I'm not telling you to go write a resume that is 10 pages long. However, if you're trying to, if you've heard um, any kind of advice that says, hey, one page is the most you should have, that I would say as a recruiter does not uh, tell your entire work story. When I'm reading your resume, I want to know what have you done in your career? Now, if you were, if you're an entry level grad or you are changing careers, things like that, if you don't have a lot of work experience, I can understand having a one page resume. However, anybody with more than three years of experience is going to have more than a one page resume. So ideally, uh, ideally, this is not a rule of thumb. However, uh, you should have like a two to three page resume. Now, can you go more than three pages? You can, however, you're going to lose the person after the third page. Um, the second thing I would say is kiss. Keep it simple um, and that's all you need to worry about. You don't need fancy fonts. You don't need fancy tables. You don't need fancy columns. You need to showcase your experience and you need to keep it simple. The simpler the format, the better it's going to come across. Now, there are a lot of applicant uh, tracking system, which is also referred to as ATS, that doesn't always parse properly. You think about it uh, in the sense of tele or ISIMs. Um, they don't always parse your resume properly. So don't try and overcomplicate things with, you know, fancy fonts, fancy tables, fancy columns, um, things like that. I would definitely recommend against having uh, columns or tables because they're not going to always parse properly. Now I do see a lot of questions coming in, so I'm gonna take a second uh, to answer them in a uh, live format. Um, Harsh, um, does this advice also apply to university application resume? So if you are a new grad that doesn't have a lot of work experience and you can fit 
accurately fit all of your resume, um, all of your experience on a one page resume, great. If you need a second page, that's okay as well. Um, the other thing I would say is I see, in, especially in engineering, people rate their own skills. Don't do that. Uh, you yourself cannot accurately rate your own skills because you don't know um, your colleagues or other people in the industry what they are rating against that skill. Uh, as a recruiter, I've seen hiring managers kind of say like, it's a little bit of a yellow flag. Like, how do you know you're a nine out of 10 in Java? Um, how do you know you're a nine out of 10 in .NET Core or Adobe Photoshop, whatever it may be. Don't use a scale that um, says, oh, you are three out of five or nine out of 10, whatever it may be. Don't use that. You can list those skills on your resume. You don't need to rate yourself on that. Um, Word or PDF. <laughs> um, you know, this is an age old debate and it's an age old question. It doesn't matter. Um, sometimes PDFs are better. Uh, sometimes Word is better. Um, use Word, see if you can upload it, see if it parses in the applicant tracking system that you're sending in. If it is, great. If you want to use PDF, you can definitely use PDF, but PDF doesn't always parse your information accurately in uh, legacy applicant tracking systems like Taleo doesn't always parse resumes um, really well. So use Word and those are the two main formats I would recommend. Um, don't use .text um, on a notepad because that doesn't translate well at all. Um, now, as far as the next step is education. Unless you are a education, unless you're a new grad, your education should not be on the top of your resume. And, and you should not list your graduation dates either unless you're a new grad and don't ever, ever list your GPA. Um, none of those things matter to me, a recruiter that has hired plenty of entry-level new grads and as well as most of the managers I've worked with. Um, yeah, it's nice that you have a 3.9 uh, GPA, but we also want to see what work experience you bring or what knowledge you bring. And that's going to matter more than your GPA. Your GPA is a good thing if you have a 3.5 and above, if you're proud of it, list it, but it's not going to really make a difference in our, um, from our end. Oh, lots of questions. Um, Juma, what's the difference between a CV and a resume? So a CV is, a CV stands for curriculum vitae, which um, is typically in academic settings where it uh, talks about your entire work history um, more in chronological order, but also doesn't go into detail about a lot of things. Um, if you're working in the academic settings or nonprofit settings, you will see a lot more CVs. But in the US, most people use resumes because we want to know work, what accomplishments you've had at your workplace, what have you done, um, and uh, what do you bring to the table, and how does your experience align with the jobs um, that you're applying to? Um, let's see, uh, put on how to edit job titles to appeal when previous role. Oh, um, so if on your resume, say you, I'll take, uh, I'll use this example. If you, if your current job title at your current company is a program manager, but what you're doing realistically is a product management role, on your resume, it's okay because it's such a small transition. But when you fill out the, when, once you get the offer and when you fill out the uh, background check information, you want to provide the accurate um, job title that you had at your current uh, organization or the previous organization. On the resume, like in the same field, it doesn't really matter that much. So um, for example, my, my last job, my official title internally was technical recruiter, senior technical recruiter. Now, when I was applying to my current job, I didn't list it as a senior technical recruiter. I just listed as a myself as a senior recruiter. So that level of um, change is okay as long as you're honest in your background check, because if you're in your background check, you're dishonest, that is going to be a red flag for your employer. 
Um, Seraphine, when a job ad asks for a bachelor's degree, does this mean that if you have a master's degree, you should not apply? You should absolutely apply. If a job is asking for a bachelor's degree and you have a master's degree in that field, yes, absolutely, you should apply. Why wouldn't you apply? Um, about ATS. Um, sorry, I'm looking through some questions over here. Um, I was going to ask about ATS and advice about tailoring your resume to be more su successful. Can you elaborate more on that question? Because I don't necessarily understand that question and I want to make sure that I, I answer the question that you're asking. How can I write work experience that is less than one year in the resume? Just, you don't need to use the month and the date, just use the year. So if you are, uh, if you had been somewhere from say November, 2021 to October, 2022, you can do 2021 to 2022. You don't need to write November to October or things, something like that. Do you recommend summary and skills at the top of the resume? That is more so a reading. It's a personal preference. Every recruiter sees it differently. I do like seeing your summary and skills at the top of the resume. There's no harm in putting it at the top of the resume. There's also no harm in putting it at the bottom of the resume. The summary should be on top of the resume. The skills, wherever you want to put it, it's totally okay. Uh, do these tips apply to federal government employees? I don't know if these tips will apply to federal government employees because I have never recruited federal government employees. Um, and unfortunately, I don't want to lead you astray. So I apologize about that. Um, JobScan recommends 1,000 words, Mac. How does that fit with your two to three page rule? I mean, that should fit in your two to three pages. I believe most... Uh, resumes would be about 500 words per page. Um, I'll have to look at my own resume, but I think like I have more than a thousand words on my resume and my resume is about two and a half pages. So yeah, it should be fine. Um, does the resume should match the exact keyword in the job description to pass the ATS? So here's the thing again. Um, Passing the ATS is not a thing. Applicant tracking system is a database um, and it's a digital filing cabinet. Now, should you match, should you match the language of the job that you're applying to, to your resume? Yes, you should. Going back to the program versus product management, right? If somebody is talking about road mapping, strategy, pricing, go to market, things like that, and you have all of those skills and you're not showcasing that on your resume, then you do need to match uh, the keywords from the job description if you have the skills and if you have the experience on your resume. If you don't have it, that's a different story. But when um, I've worked for small organizations and I've worked for large organizations and anytime somebody applies, I can see your resume and I do read every single resume that comes through uh, my desk. Can you please uh, repeat what you have? Um, we should, yes, correct. You should not have columns. Do not have columns, do not have tables it will not always parse appropriately. It will not always get to the other side in front of a recruiter appropriately because not all applicant tracking system have the capability, especially not the legacy ones. They don't always work out really well when you're putting in columns and fancy fonts and all of that. You know, like how we all complain about, oh, you know, I uploaded my resume. Now you're asking me to refill all of this information all over again, which is already on my resume. That is what's happening because the applicant tracking system is not able to read what is coming through on your resume because of all of the fancy fonts and format and all of that. Keep it simple. Um, are these rules same for European companies? I couldn't tell you. I apologize. Um, I believe that European companies typically use CVs and not resumes. So I believe the rules are a little bit different for European companies. There are also different laws when you're applying to in European companies than there are in US. Any issue sending the resume both Word and PDF? Nope, go for it. If it allows you to up uh, upload both Word and PDF, you should absolutely do that. Um, what are some of examples of how to show value of skills versus nine out of 10? 
So if you're trying to show the value, say you have experience in, we'll use accounting um, as a section, right? Like if you have experience um, saving the company money in accounts receivable or saving the company money in accounts payable, instead of rating yourself five or nine out of 10 in accounts pay payable or accounts receivable, you can use the numbers, um, estimated numbers, if you have the actual numbers, great. You can use the numbers under your job, under your work, and say, I saved the company X amount of money uh, by implementing this process or implementing the strategy. And um, that way you're showing that you actually have that skill rather than just you know, rating yourself, because even if you're rating yourself, I don't know what you've done to earn that rating in your own mind. So you still need to showcase it regardless um, and use accomplishments, use numbers if you can, whenever you can to show the value that you're bringing. Um, in that, let's talk about that a little bit more. Uh, and I know I'm going through this very quickly, so I'm gonna take a second here. Um, when you're talking about resume optimization, historically what I've seen is that people will just copy and paste their job uh, duties from the job that they're currently at and post on their resume. That has been the case where people were looking for that, like, what did you do? Um, in this day and age, I would say in the US, in the corporate sector, most people are looking not just what you have done, but what you have accomplished. Um, and that definitely is going to make a deeper impact uh, when you're applying to various jobs than just listing your job duties, right? I source for tech, right now I source for technical product managers. If I say on my resume sourced for technical product managers at AWS, that's great. That is a good skill. But if I say I placed over 40 senior and principal level technical product manager at AWS, that's a different level. Not only am I saying that I did this, I'm also showing the exact number of value that I provided. And anybody that recruits for technical product managers and technical product managers themselves will tell you they're not easy to come by. So that's the difference uh, when, it, when we talk about your accomplishments. Now, you might say, hey, Tejal, like, I don't have any numbers. Like, I don't work in a field where I can give out those numbers. And I would push back and say, that is not 100% accurate. You might have imposter syndrome. And I need you to go back and look at all of the things you accomplished. Because if you implemented a new process, that, was it. that saved the company time and money. That uh, those numbers matter. If you, um, you know, help your coworker with a new skill, taught them the improved efficiency, that is the skill that matters. Those are numbers and accomplishments that you should definitely list on your resume, right? It goes back to, I hire and recruit for technical product managers versus I placed over 40 technical, senior and principal level technical product managers. That difference is going to make that, statement difference is going to make all of the difference in your job search. Um, sorry, Paige. You're fine, this is great. <laughs> is it a good idea to include list a career break and its reason in the work experience section? Um, is it a good idea to list your career break? Yes, is it, uh, do you need to list the reason why you're taking career break? No. If you say um, career sabbatical or personal sabbatical from this time to this time, that's totally fine. Um, it's when people don't list and there's a gap, that's when the question starts. So if you list it, personal sabbatical, career sabbatical, whatever it may be, you don't need to go into a lot of details about it. Um, what font and size do you recommend to make it easier for the ATS to read your resume. I would say go. Um, I would say go basic. Uh, Times New Roman, Arial works just fine. 11, 12 uh, font size works just great. Don't go anything below ten. Uh, if you're, you know, we are going back to one page, like trying to fit everything in one page. Don't do that. Uh, Eleven to twelve font size is going to work out really well because most people can read that. We're used to that font size. And Times New Roman, Calibri, um, 
aerial um, are normal uh, normal fonts that we are used to seeing all the time. So um, I have a skill badge for Excel. Should I add it on my resume? I would not recommend adding that on your resume because the LinkedIn skill badge for Excel is great to have. Um, but if I open your resume and if I go on your LinkedIn profile, I'll be able to see that skill badge for Excel. So it's a give or like it's a hit or miss. Like you can if you have the space, um, but if you don't want to add it, you don't have to add it. Now, one thing I do want to mention, one of the biggest thing I see people not do is not list their contact information on their resume. And it should be on top of the resume and it doesn't go in your header. Your name, your cell phone number or your uh, phone number and your email address. Those three things are absolutely necessary for anybody to be able to contact you. If I don't have your cell phone number, if I don't have your email address, I can't contact you, right? Yes, you can put your LinkedIn profile, but not all, think about it this way, not every recruiter and every company has LinkedIn recruiters and emails uh, for, the, for their recruiters. So make it easy, uh, put your email address and put your phone number on your resume. And the other thing about your contact information is don't you don't particularly need, need to list your city, state, or zip, um, or your full address. Definitely don't list your full address. But even city, state, zip on this day and age, I would say I would recommend getting um, out of the habit of putting that unless it's a traveling job. Um, if it's a traveling job where you know they need to know whether you are in um, city X Y Z. Yes, you can list city, state, uh, no zip, um, and definitely not your full address. Because remember, y'all, there are stalkers out there. You don't want your information, especially if you're putting your resume out in um, job sites like Monster, Career Builder, Dice, LinkedIn, things like that. Don't list your full uh, home address. Uh, be safe out there. I've had uh, candidates uh, that told me that there were stalkers that followed them because they had their resume on, uh, their address on their resume. Um, is it better to list skills next to the relevant job experience or separately at the top of the resume, for example? Um, Kip, I would say that it, um, I like the skills at top of the resume. So there are instances where people do put it uh, next to the work experience at the bottom or at the bottom of their individual work experience. Either way, it doesn't really matter as long as you're listing the skills and showcasing how you've utilized those skills and how those skills um, have been impactful. The issue I would see um, in listing your skills is not showing what you did with those skills, right? So if I put out on my resume that I am an Excel guru, I'm not. If I put out on my resume that I'm an Excel guru, but at no none of my jobs uh, and um, in none of my jobs on my resume, I list out how I used Excel or what I use Excel for, it doesn't really matter to the reader because I'm not saying how Excel is going to benefit the other person because your resume is not about you, it's about what the other person can get out of it, right? You're writing the, your resume for somebody else to read. So as long as it's providing value, that's what is going to matter. So if you're listing, whether you're listing your uh, skills at the top or right after your job, whatever job it may be, just make sure that you're showing how those skills translate into accomplishments and what you did with those skills. Um, Jessica, what is the best way to show different language skills? Um, I would say as a person that's quadrilingual, unless you're applying for a job that requires you to have knowledge of different languages, you don't need to list that. So if you're applying to say um, a bilingual, uh, a job that requires you to be bilingual, English and Spanish are the most common one, you can list that you're bilingual um, and a list that you, you know, whether you're intermediate, you're uh, native, advanced, whatever that may be. But unless you're not, a, if you're not applying to those kind of jobs, you don't need to list your languages um, as a skill. Um, Mary, what about applications that require graduation year? 
Um, if they require you to have your graduation years, go ahead and upload it uh, in the application itself. You still don't need to list that on your resume because your resume is going to be like a singular place that you edit, edit less than for less than five minutes every time you apply to a new job. Um, so if an application requires you to have a graduation year, you can input that accurately and honestly in the application. You don't need to list that in, in, the, in your resume itself. No, list, no need to list graduation dates for experienced hires. No, absolutely not. You don't need to list that um, your graduation dates. It doesn't matter, you have work experience. That work experience is going to matter a lot more uh, than your degree. And I say this as a person that has a master's that just got her master's. I don't have my master's listed. Um, the year that I graduated with my master's on my resume, because it doesn't matter. I have plenty of work experience that um, if a person wants to see it, that's going to matter more than my master's degree. Um, if I can I list high honors, does it play any role? Um, you're an entry level grad, it can. If you're not an entry level grad, it won't. Um, and the high honors thing is more, going to be more in the academic settings um, or settings that require high level of degrees, like there are uh, companies and organizations and jobs that do need um, people with masters, PhDs, things like that. You can list that if you're applying to those kind of roles. However, if you are applying to a corporate role, it's likely not going to make a huge difference. If we don't have Word as it is subscription-based app, will RTF from another app suffice? Yes, if you don't have Word, uh, Microsoft Word is, you're right, it is a subscription-based service. Use Google. Um, Google Docs is going to work out really well. And um, I know JobScan has uh, templates, Google Docs has templates, there are templates everywhere um, that you can use and edit and download it into a Word form. You don't need to have a subscription for Microsoft Word to download a Word document as long as you have it um, on your computer. You don't need to have a subscription. Would you, how would you address a career break in resume and cover letter? Uh, so career break, like I mentioned, um, you should just list that you had a career break, whatever the sabbatical is and whatnot. Typically, I am against cover letters because most of them are not read um, unless you're applying for, again, academic settings, nonprofit settings, you're applying to be a writer or some, some sort, or um, you know, it's a writing job. That's when cover letters can be helpful to show your writing skills. And you can address um, your career break and just a single statement. I was on a personal sabbatical from, um, my career from this day to this day. And this is how I kept up my skills. If you took any classes, if you watched any YouTube videos, if you try to keep up with your skills, you can address that in your cover letter. But most part, most roles, I don't recommend cover letters. I'm not a big cover letter person. Uh, Aparna, um, I have 15 years of experience, three pages to look. Hey, um, I would say no more than 10 to 15 years of experience. And I'd say this is a general statement. It doesn't matter whether you're in tech, it doesn't matter where you are. If you have more than 10 to 15 years of experience, don't go back beyond that. Um, if a job requires you to have, say, 10 plus years of experience, I would only list like the 10 to 15 years of experience. Most jobs are not going to require more than 15 years of experience, so don't go back uh, further than that. It is also a way to combat ageism because um, as we know, ageism is still a real thing. So you don't want, if you have 20, 25 years of experience, which is great, it's wonderful. However, the experience that you have, uh, the things that you did 20 years ago um, might be stale, might not be relevant anymore. And the way you did it might also not be relevant anymore because technology has evolved, the work culture has evolved. So leave that, um, you can have a master resume, put that on there if you were ever career changing, but I would not go beyond 15 years of experience unless the job asks for it. The job asks for 10 years of experience, list only 10 years of your work experience. 
Um, I'm a designer. Can I send a resume in PDF with design samples at the end? Um, I would recommend um, your resume being a separate document than your design samples. Now, most places you can add a secondary document um, in your uh, application, or um, the, there are met plenty of sites where you can list your uh, design samples, where you can host your design samples for free, um, and you can link it back to your um, link that link back on your resume. So if I was the recruiter, I wanted to see your design samples because I'm hiring a designer. I can click on that link and send that over. I would not list your design, I would not put your design samples in your resume. Those are two different documents. Um, <clears throat> now, um, Kimberly, what do you think of writing? Um, yeah. If you have a portfolio with your work, um, showcasing your work, absolutely, um, you can put that link in the contact section. I would not put that in the summary section, put it in your contact section. And um, with portfolios and whatnot, um, if you're in data science or data analytics, like it's not going to matter that much. Um, if you were a software engineer, if you were a designer, a graphic designer, a videographer, things like that, I would say, yes, it would matter. But for data science, data analytics, like it won't really matter. Maybe your GitHub link, but that's about it. Um, Alex, uh, changing resumes to meet specific keywords can be time consuming. I agree. What do you think of having a master resume that shows the key responsibilities of your role and some more applications? So if it takes you more than five minutes to edit your resume to the job that you're applying to, to match their skills, you are you're casting too wide of a net. It shouldn't take you more than five minutes for the most part. Um, I like, I have a master resume. I like the ha idea of having a master resume. So whenever I'm applying to a role where certain things are different, I can plug and play that and it takes me less than five minutes. But yeah, I, if it takes you more than five minutes to uh, meet specific keywords and not meet specific keywords, but to showcase how you, your uh, work experience matches the job's experience, your, your net is cast too wide. Uh, I get a lot of opinions from recruiters, often even contradicting whom to trust, or is it a guessing game? Um, as a recruiter, here's the first thing I'll tell you. Listen to the recruiters from the companies that you're applying to. So if uh, you were applying to my company, I would say that you should listen to me. If you were applying to Google, I would say oh, listen to the recruiter at Google because I don't know how Google does things because I've never worked at Google um, or how they are currently doing things. And the Google recruiter, they are not going to know how I do things, right? Uh, or how um, Amazon Web Services does things or any other company that I work for. So if there is a recruiter from the, your target company that is posting out there, follow them and follow their advice because they're likely speaking from their experience on how things are happening in that moment at that company. But um, don't follow blindly just because I say something, you know, if I say I don't like, you shouldn't only have a one page resume, but Google or Meta or whatever other company wants you to have a one page resume, you should listen to them because they know how they hire, I don't. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see, if an application has been rejected, is it true that applicants are blacked out for, for a certain time frame? I've never heard of this. Um, as far as I know, if your application has been rejected and say the job opens back up in two weeks, three weeks, whatever the time frame may be, and you are still qualified, go for it, go ahead and apply. There's no blacking out or uh, blocking a candidate from applying um, part of um, the US um, and working in the US, every company has to abide by EEOC, which is Equal Employment Opportunity um, Organizations, right? So 
part of that is that no company can tell you, no, you cannot apply for X number of time frame. That is not how that works. It is literally against the law. So I would say that if you are qualified, you can go ahead and apply again. Um, there are various reasons why companies repost jobs. Might be a new role, the person that they might have been making the offer to, didn't, if the offer didn't go through, whatever the case may be. Go ahead and apply if you, um, if you are qualified. Do we have to add some? Um, so associates versus bachelor's degree. So if a res, if a job is requiring a bachelor's, um, typically I say don't look at the degree requirements um, unless you we're talking about like academic settings or something like that in the corporate world. People write bachelor's degree or equivalent numbers of years of experience, right? If you have an associate's degree, you can list that on your resume. Um, and um, if, but and on top of the associate's degree, if you have the work experience to match the bachelor's, the equivalence of a bachelor's degree, go for it. Um, you can list your associate's degree. I have my associate's degree listed on my resume. And I do believe that you should list your associate's degree on your resume, not necessarily your high school degree, but definitely your associate's degree. Um, the other thing I would say is I've seen candidates um, put different colors. We talked about fonts and we talked about sizes, but I haven't sp spoken about uh, different colors because there are people that would have their resume in 50 different colors. Don't do that. Use black uh, or yeah, black would be the standard. Use those standard um, font color, and that's all you need. And also, don't really like highlight or bold random keywords because it might not um, help you. Um, so leave it as it is. Keep it simple. You don't need fancy colors. You don't need different colors, and you also don't need to highlight um, specifically highlight or bold your certain keywords or phrases on your resume. Um, you know, if you're qualified, the recruiter is going to see it, the hiring manager is going to see it, and that's all you need. Um, how long should the time interval be on a resume? For example, five years from the last job due to relocation, due to picking jobs from one's career path, how should that be listed? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not sure I understand this question. Uh, how long should the time interval be on a resume? Um, if you haven't worked in the last five years uh, because um, of relocation, you went to go get your master's or your further education and whatnot, it, you know, your timeline is what your timeline is and you should accurately re reflect that on your resume. That's another thing. Don't ever lie on your resume because it will come out and um, it won't look good, right? There's a trust issue there. If you lie on your resume, if you lie on your application, if you lie on your background check, that is, there is a trust issue. Would you trust somebody that just lied to you? You wouldn't, you likely wouldn't. So um, your interval is what your interval is and you know you need to be honest about it. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, why should you not mention the year of graduation uh, for your bachelor's degree or your master's degree or whatever it is? Um, it's because ageism is real. Um, you are either, you can be either perceived too young, too old, uh, whatever it may be. So I always recommend don't list your graduation year on your resume or on your LinkedIn profile um, because it doesn't matter, especially if you have experience, real world experience, if you have that. Your graduate when you got your degree is not going to matter. Um, and background verification. Yeah, the red flag is when you lie on the background uh, verification application. So going back to the title thing, right? If you have similar but not the same title, you can list that similar title on the resume. But when you're applying um, and when you get the offer and you're uh, working on your filling out the background check application, you need to list accurate information, i.e. the job title that you have at the organization that needs to be listed because that verification is going to happen. Um, and that is a little bit of a red or a yellow flag if you're lying on that application. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, Bill, if you've applied for a role with a company in the past and gone through the interview process but not hired, is it okay to go back and apply for the same role if it's posted a, reposted a year later? Am I not the right candidate or not the right candidate versus the applicant who I'm competing against each time? Um, if it's been a year, um, absolutely go ahead and apply again. Uh, you, I always say this, you can do everything right in your resume, you can do everything right in your job search and still not land that job because there might be somebody better than you in that moment. If it's been a year, if it's been six months and you wanna apply again because that is your dream company, go for it. If you've gone through the uh, hiring process previously, you know what it looks like. So you're better prepared um, this time around than you were the first time around. Oh, that's a great question, Pearl, I love it. Um, no. Don't list your references on your resume. Uh, and also don't list uh, the statement references available upon request. There's absolutely no need for either one of that. Um, your references, um, especially if your uh, resume is on any of the job sites, your the contact information of your references might be used as sales lead. You don't want your references to be getting calls all of this time, right? And the statement references available upon request is an obvious statement. Yes, if we need re references, you're going to give it to us. Um, you, if you choose to give it to us, you're going to give it to us. So no need to list your references on your resume. If they need it, they'll ask for it. Um, but that is valuable real estate. Don't use it for that. Hmm. Um, you can have, um, so you can do text to columns, um, Robin, you can do text to columns. So if you list all of your, um, skills and you, uh, tra translate that on Google docs, word, Apple docs, whatever it may be, you can translate that into columns. That's okay. It's the tables that make it a little bit weird. Um, if you add a table, that is an object uh, that the ATS might not be able to translate um, into accurate text. It's If it's just text listed in two different columns, that's totally fine. Um, does an ATS blacklist someone if they keep applying for multiple jobs at a company and keep getting rejected? Nope, there's no such thing. Um, I have not met a single applicant tracking system that can automatically do X, Y, Z for whatever reason without a human saying that. And I've not met a single applicant tracking system that will have this feature. Because again, it goes back to EEOC. You cannot just blacklist candidates just because they're applying to multiple jobs. It's it's not a thing. Um, Ananya, what is more valuable, master's degree or work experience? Depends on who you ask. Some people, um, put more value in a master's degree. Some people put more value in work experience. Um, so I would say they are equal um, and also not equal uh, to me personally. Um, I, you know, if you're getting a master's degree or you're getting an MBA um, to fill time um, or to get ahead, but you don't have the work experience, that's going to like, the work experience is always going to be weighted more. But if you go get your master's degree or you even go get your PhD and you want to learn something new about your industry or whatever that degree is, and that's going to be valuable as well. So it's going to matter what's more valuable. It's very subjective. Um, to me, they both uh, matter equally and they don't matter equally. So um, Anna, what if you earned your degree outside of the US? I feel like ATS are not showing my resumes because they cannot match my university. Um, that's not a thing. Um, so if you're applying to a job and you've listed your um, education outside of the US and the applicant tracking system is not asking like it's not a list that it's pulling it out off of it's not going to matter um people can human beings can always see your resume um if i go in even if um say somebody was um rejected based on a knockout question i can still see the that person's resume there's no such thing as an applicant tracking system hiding 
your resume from a human being. Again, it's a database. If I go in and if I want to see it, um, you are more than, like I can more than see your resume and your application. Um, <clears throat> again, you all like this is going to be my soapbox for twenty seconds. Um, there is no such thing as an applicant tracking system hiding your resume. It is a database. Every recruiter I know can see your, every application that has been put in front of, even if that candidate or that applicant was rejected based on a knockout question. Um, we cannot just hide a resume just because. Um, <clears throat> so um, let's see. Okay, to reapply to a job at the same company after you've been rejected? Yes, you can definitely reapply. Um, Pallavi, resume templates. Um, I believe, Paige, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you all have resume templates, right, uh, on your site? Yes, we do. Yes. You can find those in our um, in our learning center. Um, both, I believe both free and premium users can both access those. Yeah. Um, but I would say that um, for the most part, uh, your resume template should look something like your contact information, summary, skills, work experience, and education. That's going to be my um, resume template, quote unquote, if you will. Um, let me actually show you all. I know I said I didn't have a slide deck and I don't, but I wanna share something with all of you for a second. Um, So share screen. Okay. So um, since we were talking about what resume templates and whatnot, let me show you what my resume looks like. Uh, now my resume is a little bit different because this one was for a award that I was uh, going up for at my university. Uh, but typically my education would be at the bottom. My community involvement would be at the bottom and my skills would be at the top along with my contact information and my work experience. So this is how I would, this is how I have uh, formatted my resume. Now you can use this format. You don't have to use this format. Um, you can use the amazing format that JobScan has uh, for both its free and premium users. Um, as long as, as it's not too complicated, the format itself is not going to matter that much. So. Um, high school diploma experience, but you have a bachelor's in uh, Tara, so if a job is dating, you only need a high school diploma with no experience, but you have a bachelor's and some experience, would you be overqualified? Maybe, maybe not. Um, minimum qualifications uh, do mean minimum qualification that a person would need to get uh, this job, to accomplish the task of this job. That is like, the minimum, uh, bare minimum qualifications that a person needs. Now, if you have a bachelor's degree, you have some experience, and you're applying for a job that ha only needs a high school degree with no experience, I would ask you, uh, why wouldn't you apply to a job that in the same field that requires a bachelor's degree and some experience because you are clearly qualified for that level and not the lower level. If your situation is such that you need a job and, you know, you feel like you can do this job because you have the experience in the bachelor's degree, go for it. Um, if that's your situation, I would I would never say no to somebody to apply to a job. If your situation requires you to apply to that job, go ahead and apply to that job. And um, here's the one thing that people don't talk about often. It is that you can, I think I said this already, you can do everything right and still not get selected for the job. If you're doing, if you're applying where you feel overqualified or underqualified, be prepared for the no. And that is the biggest thing I would say is to uh, brace yourself or prepare yourself for the no and assume a no is coming until a yes comes. My grandfather always used to say, you know, hope for the best, prepare for the worst, that way you won't be disappointed no matter what. Yeah, Teja, I think that's just great advice. Um, I know one of the things that our users struggle with a lot is just that 
they start to feel discouraged and um, not good enough. And I think as long as you can kind of keep your, um, you know, remain hopeful and encouraged, that's actually going to help drive your job search a lot more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, people don't often talk about the heartbreak and the, I, I like to call it depression that comes with getting so many no's, right? It, it absolutely gets you depressed, it gets you down. The imposter syndrome kicks in like, am I not good enough? Why, why aren't they saying yes? What, what is happening? Remember, you can only control what you what is in your control. If there is something that's not in your control, let it go because it will make your life so much easier. Yeah, and just know everybody that the reason we're doing this um, summit right now is because of all the job loss and layoffs that have been happening. So none of you are alone in this. It's it's something that so many people are dealing with right now. So, um, you know, try to keep your spirits up and do everything you can. And, and if you're here, then you are doing, um, doing everything you can. Yep. I feel, um, it's, I think we talked about this, but I think like I'm at one thirteen. the questions, the time that came, like the question that came at like one thirteen, and it's one fifty one or one fifty two over here. <laughs> I know these are great uh, questions and I think everybody's probably so excited that you're actually taking the time to answer all of their questions. Yeah, I can like I said I can talk about resume optimization of 50 like for hours and hours in 50 different ways but it like I know that everyone's resume is going to be unique and they're going to have questions and I figured like yeah. answering questions is going to be much better use of time. Um when okay so I See, when we customize our resume to a particular job, do you advise we match our profile title on the resume exactly to the job title which we're applying for? Yes, as long as it's similar or relevant. Now, if you're applying, um, say if I was applying to be a manager of recruiters, I would not change my job title on my resume because I've never been a manager of recruiters. But if I were, if the instance uh if it changes senior recruiter versus corporate recruiter or corporate recruiter versus senior recruiter that's that level of uh similarity or dissimilarity is okay just don't lie on your application i would never put on my resume that i was a recruiting manager because i've never been a recruiting manager um what are your suggestions when downshifting your managerial experience when applying for a different role? Um, if you have managerial experience, um, but you also have individual contributor experience and you want to go and take that step and become an IC again, focus on the IC work that you've done and not the managerial work. The IC work will go on the top of the, your work experience in every single job. And the managerial one will be at the bottom of your work experience because what you want to focus on is what you can bring to the table as an individual contributor rather than a manager. <clears throat> when is the degree date no longer needed? Five years, I would say. After five years, if you have uh, work experience, you don't need uh, your degree years. Um, typically, I would say only the degree should only matter when you are an entry level or a New York grad. Um, how long should the summary be? Um, so I would say two to three sentences, no more than two to three sentences, because then it's a run on paragraph and you don't want it to be a run on paragraph. Everything else that you need to say about yourself needs is going to go in your work experience because you're going to show how you're qualified and what you've been doing. <clears throat> uh, since companies are Companies are now looking at soft skills instead of hard skills. Do you recommend a functional resume to highlight the skills and accomplishments a job seeker has? I don't ever recommend a functional resume in a corporate setting. I have never recommended that, and I will probably never recommend a functional resume instead of a chronological resume in a corporate setting because a chronological resume is going to tell me not only what you've done, but where you've done it and what you've accomplished there. Um, soft skills are not going, companies are not assessing your soft skills on your resume. We don't know, right? Like we don't know whether you're detail oriented just by reading on your resume. We don't know that you are um, um, 
results oriented. Those are soft skills. Um, and we don't, we're not going to know until we talk about it with you. So focus on your resume is about your hard skills. Focus on that on your resume. The soft skills are going to come out uh, during your interview process. Um, Tejal, I'm seeing this yeah. question maybe a little bit farther down. I've seen it a couple of times. Okay. And I know the answer, but I want to know what you say. Um, people are asking about hiding keywords with white font. <laughs> you go first, Paige. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely do not recommend that. You might get through, you know, the ATS. You might end up higher on the recruiter's list, but um, they will find out if you're not qualified or if you don't have those skills. Yeah, um, so there are recruiters that uh, use applicant tracking systems that do keyword ranking, not hiding, keyword ranking. So if you have certain keywords, you're higher on the rank. Um, and if you don't have the skills, you want to get in front of the company, you kind of, you know, I've heard that advice so many times. Oh, you know, hide uh, keywords uh, in white text that like in header, footer, site uh, panels, whatnot. Don't do it. Um, because if you don't have the skills, you don't have the skills. And even if you do get on the top of the list, if the recruiter does use this, that means you're still going, like when the recruiter sees that they're going to see that you're not qualified. So you're still going to get rejected. So if you, whether you, either you have the skills or you don't, and if you have the skills, like we talked about, match, uh, the keywords in your work experience, not in a hidden font because I promise you, it's not going to get you much further than you were going to get in, get anyway. Yeah, and I think like both you and Adiana, who presented earlier, um, said ATS are not the enemy. They're there to get your information organized and get it in front of the recruiter. So it, you shouldn't think of it as something that you need to beat. Um, yeah. And I think that's something that we've learned a lot from recruiters like you. Um, at JobScan because we did used to use that language and we've learned that that's just not the truth anymore. Yeah. Um, I think we should probably start thinking about wrapping up. I can't believe how many amazing questions we've gotten. I've been with JobScan for six years and I've been taking notes the entire time because I'm learning so much. Um, I want to remind everybody about the promo code, which is here on the upper right hand side for new premium users. Um, that again is jobscan.co slash promo slash no fear 2022. Um, that'll get you 20% off. Um, I believe that's all we have today. Uh, thank you so much, Tejal. Um, of course. Today is our final, it's our final presentation of the day, but tomorrow we have two, I believe, two sessions um, on LinkedIn optimization. So that's a great way to start learning about, you know, networking and uh, which is a great way to speed up your, your job search. So hopefully we'll see you all there tomorrow. Um, and thank you again. Thank you for having me. Thank you everyone for the great questions. All right. Goodbye, everyone.